Wait. You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hello and welcome. It is Wednesday. It is time for a brand new episode of the TV Guidance Counselor podcast. My guest this week is Tom Rhodes, who is a fantastic stand-up comedian. He was also the main guy in Mr. Rhodes, a sitcom that has come up many times on the show. If you are a frequent listener, if you are not, just trust me, it has come up several times. Uh, He is a super great guy. I always enjoyed his stand-up when I was uh, seeing him on television. We talk about it a little bit here, but I, I distinctly remember seeing him on the MTV Half Hour Comedy Hour and on his interstitials on Comedy Central and kind of following his career uh, after that. He has a pretty fascinating career. We, we talk a lot about Mr. Rhodes and Barney Miller and a lot of things that I that I have frequently discussed on the show, and it's a fascinating conversation. He's a really smart guy. I will put up all of the uh, social media information for him because he has a great podcast himself uh, that you will like if you, if you haven't listened to it. So I was glad that he was in town. He was doing Laugh Boston here, and I was lucky enough to grab some of his time, and he was very gracious with that. And I really enjoyed talking to him. So I think you will really enjoy listening to this episode. And if you have not heard the show before and you're checking it out because you are a fan of Tom's, uh, generally the way the show works is someone picks a specific issue of TV Guide. They go through what they would watch that week, and then we kind of discuss it. Occasionally, we just kind of discuss freestyle what they watched growing up and their experiences with television, and that's what we do here with Tom. So, please enjoy this week's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, Tom Rhodes. Tom Rhodes. Hello. Hey, Ken. How are you, brother? Good. What a welcome, what a Boston welcome we're hearing with the sirens, sirens in yes. the background. Yes, this is a perfect way. Some um, human heads are rolling yeah. down the street. That's what happens. That's what we do here. Thank you so much for doing the show. Uh, I, I specifically wanted to talk to you. In I wanted to meet anybody who's got a library of Congress of, of, of Congress TV, and guides. TV guides. Picture like, uh, you know, Bookshelves of TV guides, and you got like a bust of Gary Coleman, yep. a bust yep. of Emmanuel Lewis. It's actually just a mummified Gary Coleman <laughs> in like a sarcophagus, <laughs> like King Tut. Uh, I have them in a spinning rack in my in my living room, um, and that's about it. I, I kind of swap them out. There's like archives in the basement because there's you know there's just too many to have on display. I've like got this. thousands of Jet magazine. Yes, well you see like you digest. <laughs> Let me see the evolution of the Jerry Curl in photos. <laughs> the fade. So the fun thing about them for me is that, I mean, I used to pay for my own subscription when I was a kid because it was like the one highlight of my week. I would wait for it and I'd sit down and write what I was going to watch down that week. But it was the number one highest published magazine in the world. So there's so many of them. You can get them for nothing. And they're the best snapshots of popular culture because they weren't making them to be timeless at all. And so as a result, like they tell you way more than things that were made to be snapshots of a time to me not to get all I don't know um, you know what your family dynamic was like but my father we had the the Archie Bunker chair yes that only the dad could sit yeah. in did he have a remote caddy <laughs> well not a caddy but it was uh, and I used to do a joke about Star Trek that um, Star Trek is like the American family because the coolest guy sits in the biggest chair in front of a big screen TV telling everybody else what to do. Basically, my dad had the chair. You couldn't sit in the chair. But, like, if the TV guide was missing, we were all grounded. Oh, yes. No one could leave the house until the TV guide was found. You know, there was four kids in our family, and then it would be this big, like you know, hunt in the house for the TV guy. And he was usually sitting on it. Right, it was his misplacement. Know. I was going to say, people weren't, like, <laughs> squirreling it away in their bedroom. No, right. <laughs> I'm going to read what it's I not, can't watch. Right. Did you, so you had one TV in the house? Um, yeah. 
in the living room, I assume, the, the furniture TV. Yeah. And you have siblings? I had two older brothers and a younger sister. Okay, so you're right in the middle. Yeah. When you got, when he would, when your dad would sort of allow you to control the television, I assume, like, off primetime hours, what was the negotiations like with the kids? Was it oldest picked, or did you have to make your case for something you wanted to watch? Uh, no, I remember, you know, the uh, when cable came to the neighborhood, yeah. and it kind of hit our neighborhood street by street, like... There were two streets over that got cable before You'd we hear did. hear talk of cable? So we would go to the kid's house down the street and watch cable and stuff. Um, but I remember when it came, we had the cable box with the dial on it. And uh, when my parents went to bed, if you put a, a, a butter Paper knife, clip, you put a butter knife. knife in the top and you, you wiggled it around, you could get uh, Cinemax and the, the, the channels that showed. Um, yes, the Playboy channel. It wasn't the Playboy Channel then, but they would show like really soft core porn things like uh, Emmanuel, L- L- Emmanuel, Lady Chatterley's Lady Chatterley. Lover. Yeah. you know, um, for the longest time when I was growing up, I wanted to be a gardener. Yes, they got the most action. They got all the action. Yes, yeah. There was a weird thing where all those channels. So Playboy Channel used to rent. It wasn't Cinemax. It was one of the other channels. They used to like rent their signal at night. It would flip to Playboy Channel. But you weren't allowed to show hardcore pornography over the air cable, even if it was pay until 2006. So it was all softcore stuff, even if you were buying like a pornographic channel. Well, like those Emmanuel movies were great because she was traveling all over the world. Yes, you got to see great. You got to see like Indonesia and you know. It's educational. Kuala Lumpur, different places like that. I mean, you know, she she eventually had sex with with someone wherever she went, but they were great travel logs. It's not that different from the travel logs now, where instead of having sex, they just eat a meal, eat a big (laughs) yeah, a travel channel or something, which is in some ways more pornographic, (laughs) depending on who's hosting. Andrew Zimmer, very stomach churning. So the other thing about that is I don't know if kids have that MacGyverish technical innovation skill now or if it's even possible in the digital age. You can't really can't really jerry rig anything now. Yeah, I think everything is just easily Well, I mean, god, you can look up any kind of That's true. You don't really need to do that sort of thing. activity on the internet. I wonder so. if that makes kids less uh, less skilled generally or have worse coping skills because it'd be like my car broke down but I remember the butter knife trick from the (laughs) cable box and I was able to fix it like I built a black box when I was a kid with plans that I ordered in Maximum Rock and Roll magazine and parts I bought at Radio Shack for like eight dollars a black box for cable a black box for cable yeah I got a soldering iron and everything and it worked it worked yeah I built two of them and I don't uh, I don't know if I could do that now but I felt like I had a skill at that point It it was pretty exciting so you're going to other kids' house watching cable. Was there, like, a cable channel that was mythical? I imagine this was... MTV. Well, I remember it was, like, uh, when MTV came out. I think this is, like, yeah. 84, you know, when cable started coming to Oviedo, Florida. Okay. So um, you're three years into MTV, so it was well established by this point. Yeah, maybe it was 83, 82. I'm not exactly sure. But I remember that was a big deal. So, like, after school, we would go watch uh, MTV. And then... I hung out with a lot of girls in my neighborhood, and they liked General Hospital. Okay. So yeah. we would watch General Hospital, and General Hospital was riveting back then. It is weird how... It had Rick, Spr- uh, Rick Springfield, Springfield was, on, was yeah. on it. Michael Damien was and, on it. And uh, he was having a love affair with Bobby, the sexy redhead girl, yeah. and Luke and Laura was a bizarre... Rick Springfield was... I don't think people who weren't around at the time can really understand how amazingly huge Rick Springfield was, where he was on a major network television show that was huge and also like in the top five in the charts at the same time songs yeah you would never have that and actually pretty good power pop songwriter yeah surprisingly he's in boston uh, i wish that i had jesse's girl a classic girl you have very very good songs but the point is probably moot yeah you don't hear moot in very you don't hear moot ever used most lyrics don't have the same vocabulary as jesse jackson i found (laughs) 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 it usually doesn't happen there's not a lot of overlap so I, I used to work at a local television station here when I was in college, and we used to have to watch the station all day, including the soaps. And it is surpri- like people who make fun of people into soaps. I'm like, you watch three days of that soap, even against your will, and you will be into it. Right. Like, you can't not. It just it's so perfectly they get the formula down. Where even if you're fighting it after three episodes, you're like, what's going? What's happening? Well, there's been a big transformation in uh, Brazil and a lot in a lot of Latin American countries in the last few years the because. Because of the soap operas that they um, showed women using contraceptive right. and, and being, uh, you know, sexually independent right. and that controlling their thing. own bodies. So I, I read a big piece somewhere, Wall Street Journal or something, about 
you know, how women have reclaimed their bodies and right. gotten a lot of uh, from personal operas. power and freedom from watching the soap operas. And then in, in, um, in the Middle East, they, um, you know, women stand up for themselves. I think there's something to be said for shows that are written off as complete pablum, you know, garbage, because they're able to get under the radar and don't have the scrutiny and probably it's much easier for them to, to just put that stuff in because it's not like the, the, the patriarchal people who are controlling things are going to watch it. So it's like, ah, whatever. I'm not even paying Yeah, attention. right, right, right. It's a really good subversive I'm not watching that. that crap. So you, tra- you travel all over the world frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, do you watch TV when you go there? Do you make a... Yeah, and I'll tell you, um, Steve McQueen, what was that show he was in? The Rifleman? Oh, uh, no. The Rifleman was, um, was uh, Chuck Connors. McQueen? What was the Steve McQueen cowboy? Uh, McQueen um, was, I can't think. I of caught that in Paris once, and as cool as Steve McQueen is uh, regularly, Steve McQueen in French is very, it's very, very cool because cool. it probably yeah. has a smoothness that he just didn't <laughs> have in real life. Do you know that uh, Americans find it bizarre that French people think that Jerry Lewis is hilarious? Um, I've spent a lot of time in France. That the French people know that we know this, right? And uh, what I've been told is that the guy who did the voiceovers for Jerry Lewis was hilarious. I bet he probably. So it was the guy. It wasn't Jerry Lewis per se, as much as the guy who dubbed his voice. It's weird too that there are people who their career is dubbing a specific actor in a country like that. He is known if if Tom Cruise is in a movie in Ecuador, they get the Ecuador Tom Cruise guy. It's not the Ecuador Tom Cruise. If they dubbed someone in a different voice every time you saw them on screen in your country, it would be sort of weird. So it makes sense, but people are always kind of shocked that it's like, uh, I wonder if the guy who did Jerry Lewis ever tried to branch out on his own. I don't know. I wonder if he did cartoons and things. The Jerry Lewis cartoon. But, uh, you know, speaking of the power of television, I just want to say that You know, looking through these TV guides, 85, WGN would rerun the Barney Miller show at 7 p.m. And, you know, people always talked about, you know, the television is the great wasteland and it's, you know, it's maggots for the human mind and it doesn't do anything good. But my parents uh, had a very tumultuous relationship and uh, they ended up getting divorced. And my mom and my sister and I... We watched Barney Miller every day, the reruns at 7 p.m. on WGN in the, in the mid-80s. And we could be in different corners of the house. And the television, when it would come on, we, I guess we left the TV on or whatever, um, leading up to it, when the Barney Miller theme song um. started, <laughs> boom, ba-ba-boom, ba-ba-boom, we would come running from every corner of the house, yeah. and my mom and my sister and I would dance together in the living room yeah. it's a because time we of joy. loved that show. Yeah, and it was our thing that we watched together, and it was just this this beautiful moment that I'll I'll never forget. My sister passed away from breast cancer. Sorry to hear that. But um, it was people, such a beautiful, happy family moment. Yeah, and I don't know if people watch television like that now as a family part of it is because it's not appointment tv anymore you guys had to hear that music and run in and watch it because that's when it was on yeah. you couldn't go oh, I'll, I'll watch it later on the dvr after they watch it or whatever and that that was important and i the one thing that i've learned you know from talking to people last year on the show and and many of us who do comedy had a tumultuous uh, family situation that's why we're comedians that's why we're comedians but that was the thing they did together it was like i didn't ever get along with my dad we always sat and watched whatever together or yeah. anything and it's it's i wonder if the world is missing that to a degree now because i don't think parents and children watch the same thing and that's like it's not like yeah no this is a forgotten era i mean yeah. that's why your 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 podcast is um, preserving a human memory that's not talked about very often because everything is watch on demand and yeah. the binge viewing with Netflix has taken over. But the thing about TV Guide, specifically for me, that was important was uh, I wanted to be a stand up comedian. So when the TV Guide would arrive, uh, I would sit there with a highlighter. And I would go through and I would highlight the late night talk shows when they had comedians, Uh, you know, Letterman and Carson. Right. And um, And would you stay up 
I would stay up. So I'd look through the TV guide. Oh, yeah, oh, my God. Um, Emo Phillips is going to be on Letterman right, tonight. Right, right. Or, um, you know... Because you started early. You were like 17 when you started. Yeah, I started like, it was around uh, this time. February 4th, 1984 was my okay. first open mic night. Okay. Yeah. So you must, I imagine you were the youngest person there by a long shot at the time. Was everyone? Oh, yeah. Kid? No, yeah. I had a fake ID. I was, uh, oh, really? I was, uh, I was a kid. Everyone else was in their 20s. Did you ever work with anyone around that time that you had seen on the late night shows? Well, the sh- club that I started at did not have touring comedians until like 85. It was just all local comedians when I started there. And one of the first guys that they brought through was Rich Hall. Okay, yeah. And Rich Hall did Sniglets. Right, he was on SNL He was on SNL, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and, uh, I didn't bond with him then. It wasn't until years later uh, that I became friends with him, and he's one of my oldest friends in comedy, and he he lives in London. Yeah, I was going to say he has a similar career path to kind of what you did when you, you moved to another country and had your own show there. I, when I lived in the UK, actually, Rich Hall had a talk show. Where the one where he went in the boat. Yes, yes. That show was brilliant. Yeah, and he Mike went, Wilmot. Mike Wilmot yeah. is in a um, trench coat with sunglasses, yes. and he doesn't say anything the whole, they, the whole interview. And then they filmed it in the Great Lakes up in Scotland. And yep. each guest at the end of the interview, they just kind of go, the boat goes behind some reeds and you see Mike Wilmot stand up yeah. and then uh, you hear a gunshot. Yes. So every guest was murdered and their body was dumped Because you would have water. like people that were like universally bad people like Bernard Manning, like old men racist comics. I remember because yeah. I went to every taping of that show. Because when I was going to school, I basically called the BBC and was like, ah, oh, I'm a student, I'm whatever, media. You went up to the lakes? And I, I didn't go to the lakes, but they, they did studio versions of oh. because um, it aired on BBC Four, I think. And then they would show the, the lake segments in, in, in between. And I went to every taping. I think it was only about six episodes. His, uh, Rich Hall's doing his last specials for the BBC. He's done about four of them. Those documentaries. And they're brilliant. They're where, amazing. Uh, the first one was How the West Was Lost. Yes. And he takes clips from old movies. Yes. And then he did one on Southern movies. Yep, and on Hollywood. Did and one on Texas Hollywood. He did, he did another one on road trip movies. Yeah. And those those are absolutely brilliant. And they're so candid in the sort of lies that people believe about American culture based on movies. Yeah. <laughs> and and I watched them and I'm like, you would never air this here. People would be outraged. But it's not wrong. It's it's a completely interesting outlook on this stuff. And you would never get that on TV here. So that, that's always eye-opening when I go to another country, especially an English-speaking country where I can actually understand what they're saying, but uh, how different the, the, the focus is on things and how a comic like Rich Hall, who'd been working here for years, kind of, in Onion World was kind of like that in, in the early days of the Comedy Channel, which I think was probably a little bit before you were kind of doing stuff with them. He had that show, Onion World, which was sort of that sort of thing that he's doing now, but on an American TV show, but again, was just probably so under the radar because nobody was watching it and <laughs> people didn't have it. So Rich Hall came through. Did you talk to him at all? or did you, you? I did a little yeah. bit, but I mean, it was, you know, I was, jeez, I was a year into comedy. Right. I met him a few years after that right. and became friends with him. And then he went with me. I did a special for... Comedy Central called Viva Vietnam. Yes. Where I went to Vietnam. We filmed it in September 94. Okay. Bill Clinton had just made it okay for Americans to, to travel, travel to Vietnam. They had lifted the travel ban like Obama just did with Cuba. My father had fought in the Vietnam War. He was a helicopter pilot. He was shot down. And uh, it, the Vietnam was a very, you know, close yeah, topic to my family. Yeah. So, and I was Comedy Central's boy. At the time, I was like the the face of the network, and they let me do anything. So I said, why not let me go to Vietnam? And so we filmed this thing for the 20th anniversary of the end of the war, and then it came on April 95, Okay, because the war ended April 75. And how was that received? I remember watching it, but it was, uh, I remember it sort of standing out on Comedy Central. It was unlike any of the other programming that were running. They didn't really have any programming, and so uh, that show was... A critical success, and right. it, it really kind of put me on the map for right. American television. So that came on April 95, and then July 95, I did the Montreal Comedy Festival, and uh, I was the bell of the ball. 
So there was a bidding war between NBC, Fox, and HBO. Which NBC won. And I went with NBC. HBO was just offering a special. NBC and Fox were like, you know, it was, it was, it was really kind of exciting. It was like, okay, now NBC's offering this. Fox is offering this. And those days don't happen in Montreal anymore. No, no, absolutely. So, but, I mean, it was an exciting month afterwards. Yeah. And um, Fox at the time you know, really had silly, goofy programming, and uh, yeah, they, it was a no-brainer in my mind. Right. Oh, yeah, because Fox and Because even if NBC had been offering less money, and I think I did take less money to go with NBC, I had grown up watching NBC, and to right. me, NBC was the home of American comedy because, you know, the Cheers, uh, SNL, Johnny Carson, David Letterman, Barney Miller, all these favorite shows of mine had been on NBC. Taxi. Taxi. Yeah. So, I mean, it was like, oh my God, yeah, I'm, I'm going to. It's like, you yeah. know, do you want to sign with, um, the, I was going to say the Yankees, but I'm in Boston. I shouldn't That's say fine. That. No, I think we're I think we're <laughs> high enough off the ground that people can't hear you. <laughs> some asshole say fucking Yankees up there. Some guy, some guy's going to climb up with like Spider-Man suction cups to the window, <laughs> don't even mention them. Yeah, I mean, it would make it would make perfect sense to go with NBC, and NBC was sort of just reinventing themselves a little bit at that time. They had the must see TV. They were just they had the friends. Must-see TV, right? They had Seinfeld at the time. Yeah, and uh, and they were the hottest network. Yeah, Ultimate Mr. Rhodes trivia. My show took the time slot of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Ah, when that Will was, Smith yeah. had had gone on to movies, and right. so it was the next year that that opened up. So how much input did you have into the concept of that show? So that for, for people that don't know, we have discussed the show before, but it's, it's you're at a private school and you're sort of the new uh, young teacher. It was Dead Poet in. Society. Yeah. You know, it's the rebel English teacher uh, in the stuffy rich kid prep school. Right. You know, I mean, there was nothing new about the premise. When I first got the development deal, Mark Brazil was a good friend of mine, and we came up with this idea where I would be a public defender lawyer. One of my favorite shows of all time was Barney Miller, and I liked the grittiness of Barney Miller, and that they they dealt with adult themes, and the fact that... You know, they had uh, great celebrity cameos with people getting arrested and coming in, and this constant traffic in and out of the, the jail room because um, because of crimes that were committed or happening. One of the things that I always tell people that if they want to write television, watch Barney Miller because that is the purest writer's show I've ever seen because it's literally one room except for one episode. They go to a different location, but it's one room. That's it. Or two if you count Barney's office. But it's basically one room and just people talking. And it manages to get that grit and deal with tough Things like like rape and murder and these things, but not in like a snarky, um, belittling way like you would get on TV now. So absolutely, I would be 100% on board with that. So you wanted to do... So I wanted to be a public defender, the yeah. voice of the voiceless. Yeah. And um, thought that that would, you know, that would be my, my performance. Right space in front of the courtroom trying to sway the jury and things like that or the judge and somewhere about I don't know um, four or five months before we were going to do the pilot uh, NBC said we just had a a lawyer show fail right can you make Tom a teacher and it seemed like kind of a take it or leave it deal right and uh, you know youth and arrogance uh, and 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 Mark Brazil and I thought yeah, we can. Yeah, this would yeah. be great. We can do this. Yeah. And so he, he wrote a, another pilot, and uh, and NBC had bought his pilot for the for the public defender show, and then uh, we go with this teacher idea. Right. And uh, we filmed the pilot. They took four of my jokes for the pilot. Everybody loved the pilot, and they greenlighted it into be a series. That makes a lot of sense. That the public defender thing was the start because I remember that show. And, and it, you know, it may just be the few episodes that I have a vivid memory of, but there was always sort of an end scene with you sort of making a case to, was it like the dean or the school? Your adversary was kind of like the, the, the stuffiest guy. It was like the principal or something. I remember you like... No, no, no. Like Stephen Tobolowski played the principal, was, and he was very much my advocate. He was always on my side. My nemesis on the show was Ron Glass. Yes, that's who Who played yes. Mr. Felcher, yes. who was always busting my balls. Now, yes. I had never acted a day in my life. 
uh, I learned how to act on national television. and Which the, is a weird situation for Weird comics. situation to be in. But, um, well, the joke I always say is I, for the, the first four episodes, I didn't know you could use your hands. Right. You know, I'd, I'd walk in. Hey, everybody, let's go to Do class. we get taxed if I use my hands? <clears throat> the funny thing is, is, is Ron Glass... Of Barney Miller fame. Such a wonderful, magnanimous, loving man. And he and I could not have been closer friends while we were filming that series. And so it was funny to be all palsy palsy right. and laughing and that joking action. all day. And then we go on to the set and then he's like, but he's such a great actor. Yeah. You watch those episodes and like, you know, he's, he does come off as this really stuffy, snobby, intellectual guy. And and that the power of, of of what a brilliant actor he is. I mean, He's such every a great voice and every, every, his voice is incredible. Every movement, every word out of his mouth, he is completely believable as that character. And it reminded me of that uh, that old cartoon where like the is like the the wolf and the coyote yeah, or yeah, the, yeah. the sheepdog yeah the sheepdog and yeah. the coyote they're buddies and then they clock in yeah. and then the sheepdog is punching him. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and so you obviously were probably incredibly pleased to have him on the show as yeah well when Warner I remember Island. when we were casting the show I I said I I would love to have Ron Glass come in and uh, I didn't have any input on like they let me I got to choose the the title. They did, it was, you know, it was right. like the Tom Rhodes Project or something when it started. And then at one point I said, why not call it Mr. Rhodes? Right. So I got that. But, you know, they took four of my jokes for the pilot. Um, and then it was very difficult. I had no input on the writing which has to whatsoever. Which such a weird experience. Which is you're frustrating. Used to being a comic where you're in control of yeah. everything you do. Yeah, it, it, was, it was frustrating. We can get to that in a minute. But, sure. So when they were casting... The parts, Ron Glass came in for the Mr. Felcher um, thing, and uh, it, it was, it, I, he could have, he didn't screw it up, right. but he could have. He had the part anyway. He had yeah, the part yeah, in my in. mind, and, and, and because Barney Miller had meant so much to me that, you know, I wanted to work with him no matter right. what. Was he the only Barney Miller person that you had ever met in comedy? Did you ever meet any of the writers or no I never met anyone else yeah Yeah. so you well we had a we had Hal Linden oh he was he he guested on 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 one episode um towards the end and I got to meet him but I mean he's I've heard he's an amazing guy it's just uh, yeah well you know he didn't I mean he I don't know he was he was there he was there (laughs) he showed up he did his thing yeah yeah he would intimidate the hell out of me mostly from Black's Magic uh, did you ever see that show? Mm-hmm. His follow-up show to Barney Miller, which was such a great uh, comedic sort of heavy show, was an hour-long dramedy where he and Harry Morgan play father and son magicians mm. who solve crimes. Oh my God! Yes, wow. created by uh, the guy who did uh, Murder She Wrote. Yeah, it was not a hit. It's, it's not a hit. Not a hit show. Not as a soon hit as show. I unhook these rings. <laughs> yes. Oh, there's a similar trick to get me out of this. Uh, yeah, he was all he was always uh, conveniently in uh, somehow locked up by a villain with you know handcuffs or something. He was able to escape out of. It's not uh, not the best use of help. It's talents. So you're doing this show. You have Ron Glass on, and are you like I'm making my Barney Miller, or as it went along, were you kind of like this is not what I wanted this to be. I never for one second thought I was making Barney Miller. Right, right. Um, I mean, that's pretty... Or or striving to do that kind of thing. Well, I mean, the show really changed because I was... It was, the, it was never supposed to be about the kids. Right. It was... The kids were supposed to be secondary and in the background. And it was supposed to be... Um, the focus was going to be all on the adult teachers. And, uh, and, and the pilot is, is kind of like that, but there were, I'm supposed to be from this little town and I wrote one book, uh, that sold 68 copies, but whatever. Um, uh, so I come back, get the job as the English teacher, but I was supposed to have a cousin who was a bartender in a bar and okay. I would go and have a drink and I would talk to him. Right. They cut that out. So it was more like, about Right at the lives. beginning, they cut that out. And then the joke that I always say is I had no adult relationships right. on the show. I'm just hanging out with these kids. Right. Well, there was and in real interest. life, I think people like that should be closely monitored. That is a little weird, yes. Because <laughs> that was always the strange thing about the comedic teacher 
genre, subgenre. Um, you know, the Welcome Back Cotter. Uh, you have the um, Drexel's class was sort of a contemporary to Mr. Rhodes, where you had um, Dabney Coleman as a as a teacher in these well, kids. I love Dabney Coleman. He's great. What I, was that Buffalo Bill? Buffalo you remember Bill. Buffalo Bill was a great Jim Davis. show. God, great I loved show. Buffalo Bill. That was the first show I can remember where the lead character was unlikable intentionally. Like he yeah. was an asshole, and it was enjoyable to watch because <laughs> he's so great at that. Like, well, I always say that about that um, uh, Alan Partridge show in England. Yeah. Well, Coogan's that, great at that. The, 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 the lead character's unlikable. Yeah. And that in America, it would be impossible to you sell a show that. like that. You I, I found that in the last few years, since sort of British television has been influencing U.S. television a little more, for better and worse, where Alan Partridge is a subtle character in a lot of ways, which sounds a little bit ridiculous, but he's, he's unlikable, but he's also sad. Like, you feel bad for him. Yeah, he's, he's so clueless. Being, yeah. But here, when they try to make these shows with the unlikable character, they sort of remove the pathos and the empathy piece. Yeah. So it's like, this guy's a sociopath asshole. Don't you like him? And it's like, no, you kind of also have to make him broken and sad. <laughs> and you're all laughing at him. And I'm not normally one for laugh at, but, like, Coogan does it so great with all his characters. And, like, Saxondale, if you saw that follow-up show mm-hmm. that he did, he, it's a, he's a 70s failed 70s rock musician who was a, like a famous roadie and he basically lives in his small town and is just like this 60 year old dude with beard and long hair who you know is talking about Zeppelin all the time but it's similar to in a similar style of the, the Coogan thing yeah so Dabney Coleman was the closest we had to that <laughs> but Love he was Dabney still in control Coleman. but the show um, talking about the teacher thing somebody knew that that year there was going to be four or five other teacher, teacher shows, shows on. I didn't know. That must have been tough. Had I known, so like the, when the show started, it was like, oh my God. There's right. like, there was Nick Freno, yep. there was uh, there was all these other teacher shows. Like, I think there was like four of them. I think there was that, four, That yeah. same year. Yeah. And it was like, fuck, somebody must have known. Yeah. And so that, um, that was pungent to digest. Yeah. And then... The thing about having your own sitcom, uh, I've been working on a book for the last few years, and I'm I'm getting closer to the end, and I've finally um, got to write about this experience that I went through. And the thing when you have your own television show that you don't realize is the the, the critics. Um, Imagine a periodical that you have loved since its inception. Yes, yep. Says something negative about you. Entertainment Weekly, I had a subscription to from the beginning. As did I, 89. I loved (laughs) Entertainment Weekly. And you know what? It's really um, bitchy queer humor. Yeah. The way that they rip things to shreds. Yeah. And I love gay people, and I personally find bitchy queer humor is at the top of my list. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I love it. But they, they were really... Cruel. They, they had a, they, they had a, a hair chart, and it was one through five best hair on television. David Duchovny, and they had a little cut out of his head, and then it was worst hair on television. Tom Rhodes, and they had a little cut out of my head. They forget that you're a you're a person. I think with a lot of that stuff too. You know, it's like I'm not the character on the show. I'm like a real guy, and this is my actual hair. Like you wouldn't do that to just like worst hair. The guy lives down the street. I'm a real here. guy who yeah. uh, holds a grudge, seeks revenge, and uh, never forgets. Well, being cheated by spite <laughs> is a pretty good way. That's what get, wakes me up in the morning most days. <laughs> so, so those kind of things were, you know, and then it was frustrating because the show had nothing to do with who I was as a person. Right. And then I could never get any jokes in after that. Right. And your name's on it. And my name is on it. So I felt like, you know, these experts who are writing about comedy right. are writing about television. I mean, aren't they smart enough to see... It's not me. ...that uh, a show has been dumped on top of me right. and that right. uh, that I'm not writing this show? Right. So, I mean, it was frustrating in that I would go talk to the executive producer and say... So there was all these hair jokes because I had the long hair. And every episode, it's like... You know, and I grew my hair because I wanted to be Jim Morrison, and I loved Native Americans. Right. So, I mean, like, uh, I wanted to be Crazy Horse or right. Sitting Bull. And so it's like, the show is like, hey, Kenny G, hey, Fabio. Oh, why so sad today, Tom? Is your blow dryer broken? Classic. And so humor. I would read these scripts, and I would get so pissed off. 
and I would go talk to the exec, and then I wouldn't retort, and I would go talk to the executive producer and say, look, man, I'm a comedian. You know, anyone I ever considered a hero never let anybody get the last word above them or over them. And the, uh, the job of the comedian is to outwit some goon statement. You know, the reason and you so hired every me? script, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so every script, there would be these barbs thrown at me, and in the script, it would just say, Tom reacts. And I would say, so how many times can I just shrug? Right. What do you mean, Tom react? Grimace? Do I have a knife shrug? on me? Or, yeah. Right. The, yeah, I mean, it was Ron Glass's character. Yeah. And then there was like a rom- adversary romantic lead. In a Farrah Forky. Yes, who went like on to Nikki. Wings, I think, after that. She was on Wings before that. Before that, that. Yeah. okay. That must have been endlessly frustrating. Yeah, so like- I, I, I had no jokes. Right. I just gave nice advice to the kids. And... Uh, I never got another joke in Edgewise. Which is so weird because, all right, they see you do comedy. They like you, your personality, your comedy. That's what yeah. stand-up comedian is. It's, it's a heightened sense of you. They go, we want that. And then they go, but not anything that. <laughs> they just want you to be an actor, which you're not yeah. at the time. They want you to not say the words you come up with, which is what you've gotten their attention for in the first place. Yeah. So you have to wonder, what, what is it that they want? from you <laughs> well in NBC's defense it was NBC was on my side and right. the woman who brought me to the network Shelley McCrory who discovered me in Montreal you know uh, NBC it, the show was filmed at Universal now Universal and NBC are one right. at the time they were not married yet so the show was made at Universal and uh, NBC through Shelley McCrory Every week was just as frustrated as I was. So it was almost like independently. And that was that made me feel good. That you know she would say um, every every week, the notes from the network would be more Tom. We want more Tom. We 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 we, called Mr. Rhodes. We uh, you know we love this guy. We uh, secured him to make this show. And it's his personality is not in this. Did you? So you must have been somewhat relieved when it ended. I imagined. Well, I wouldn't say relieved. I uh, well, I mean, it kind of, you know, there there were there were really great moments. There was, you know, the adult themed shows were great. Like, um, I was an English teacher. Right. I they want to have an artist in residence, and I invite Charles Bukowski right. to come talk to my class in the show. The character is named Buck Pulaski, right. but it's supposed to be Charles Bukowski and played brilliantly by Brian Doyle Murray. Yes. So he shows up drunk. He's hitting on the kids. There, I get in trouble. Is there anything not played brilliantly by Brian Doyle Murray? Brian Doyle Murray is uh, one of the greatest comedic actors uh, in American history, as is Stephen Tobolowski. You know, I just recently digitized the Mr. Rhodes episodes and put uh, a bunch of them on YouTube. And... And, and Jessica Stone also, who played Amanda, the, the math teacher, what they did with their hands and facial expressions, and they invented comedy where it did not exist right. in the script, where they're just talking and they're doing things and movements that are just, just Chaplin-esque are so brilliant. And that was the thing about, but I'll, let me, I'll come back to the, the brilliance of that cast in a minute. The, the point I was going to make was... Um, so after the Buck Pulaski episode, there was an episode where I accidentally have sex with a student's mother right. the Friday before Parent Teachers Weekend. And the, the, the woman was played by Wendy Malick. Yes. And that was before she went on to... to just uh, shoot me. She was just doing Dream On at that point, I think. Yeah. She'd been on Kate Nally. So, I mean, so. that was the uh, adult theme. I mean, right. still... You know, I'm I'm kind of like this Candide character. I right. Uh, I love Voltaire, and Candide's character is just this. Um, you know, Voltaire wrote this. Um, Rousseau had criticized this poem that Voltaire wrote about the Lisbon earthquake in 1755. Mm-hmm. That that there is no God, and and. Rousseau criticized Voltaire, saying that, you know, if there's no God, we have no hope. And then right. so Candide was Voltaire's response to that, that you can't go through life 
as just this eternally optimistic, everything's going right. to be okay kind of guy. And 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 I looking back on that series, my character was like Con- Candide. I'm just right. this like You're a naive sage, goof yeah. who's just oh you can say yeah. any shitty comment to me and I shrug. I'm just gonna and take every, it. Do, 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 yeah. And life is happy, you know. Again, not stand up comedy at all. <laughs> yeah, which is it, there was a big movement to especially between like late '80s to the mid '90s to give as many stand up comedians sort of. Sick. They, for some reason, the networks were like, this is the formula. It's to give them the show, we get a stand up on the show, and then that gold. Yeah. And so. Well, I didn't, so I didn't realize that, I mean, it, you know, it became a children's show. You know, Sean Weiss, who played the goalie on the Mighty Ducks movies. Right. He was in Freaks and Geeks he, later. He was also uh, just fantastic um, with the dances and the silliness that yeah. he, he got to do. So they were, so they wrote all these great funny things for everyone else to do. Right. And I carried the plot like an albatross from right. scene to scene. And right. the you know, it was funny they would say, um, you know, you're a fish out of water. You're the you're the the cool long haired teacher in the stuffy prep school. Yeah, you're a, you're like a, a fish clash. out of water. And yeah. my advice to any young comedian who's about to have his own television show is to remember that fish out of water Die. die. Yes. And no one likes to watch a fish out of water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's just watch it fly, unless it's a fish. But I mean, so, but, uh, so all these other, you know, uh, they were, they were, they were really, I, I, I really liked the Italian episode, which uh, this Italian um, teacher comes and, and so he turned, uh, the kids fall in love with Italy and right, everything right. Italian. And then we have this um, Italian festival and they actually set up a opera karaoke and that was really cool on the set we had an opera teacher come and yeah. he taught everybody to sing opera and so there was this great scene and the the kids are all singing this opera karaoke but not me right no you're the straight not guy. me no I'm the straight no, man having fun like that so I was the straight man on everything yeah and so I'm carrying the plot I have no jokes and uh, and then I'm just supposed to shrug when yeah. a hair joke is thrown my way. But the 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 kids on the show, the whole cast, you know, it's like Seinfeld is a very wooden actor. Right. And Seinfeld is not what made Seinfeld a it's great show. Up by the ensemble. It's the ensemble around him were right. absolutely brilliant. And that's the thing about my show. It could have. It, it didn't matter right. that it was a teacher show. It didn't matter. If it was in a transmission repair shop, the fact that the actors were blindingly talented, man. Yeah. Tobolowski, Ron Glass, Jessica Stone, uh, Sean Weiss, Alexandra Holden, who was just absolutely glows on camera. She's yeah. like a movie star. Was that intimidating? No. No, because my... You know, once I got the, I never. It was never my dream to have a sitcom. I just wanted to be the greatest stand-up comedian right. alive. But once it happened, I never doubted it. And like people were always like, you know, don't get excited because most comedians, you know, you never get to pilot. You never get to pilot. Well, I got to pilot. Right. And then once we got to pilot, it never goes to series. It never goes to series. Yeah. Never. And I never doubted it for a second. Right. So it wasn't until the very end of the series that I started to like, well, shit, this might not it's work not out. Work. Because the the cast was so amazing. Travis Wester, Lindsay Sloan, who on the show she plays this nerdy girl. She's supposed to be the unattractive girl. Right. But and that just that's that's the illusion of right. television. TV because in my girl. mind, Lindsay Sloan was the most penetratingly yeah. beautiful person on that set. And uh, it just I, I just thought she was captivating. And there was it was episode number two when we come back from uh, when, when it gets made into a series is the crush episode. And she her she has a crush on me. So she's prominent in that episode. And, you know, even her thick glasses that they made her wear could not yeah, it's like, subdue her natural beauty. I mean, yeah. she, even then, as a young actor, was a movie star. She was one of the people that I, I, I felt really close with, her and Ron Glass. Right. Sean Weiss, Travis Wester, who was also brilliant as one of the students. I mean, like I hung out with them, right? And we talked, you know, and because this is new for you, you're not, you're not. Uh, I believe in it. You know yeah, what? Well, what I thought, you know, like Barney Miller in Cheers. I'm like, right. these people are going to be my family right. for the next ten years. Yeah. 
So let's hang out. So, uh, you know, Lindsay Sloan's parents hung around the set. Her father loved the blues. I loved the blues. Right. We, like, traded CDs. Um, Alexandra Holden had just moved there from Minnesota. And I loved the fact she drove this big pickup truck with these big... Fat, like a really right. not a not a regular pickup no, no, truck, like a full on pickup, jacked yeah, up size. redneck uh, mud flap car. Well, it didn't have mud flaps, <laughs> but but she said she still had Minnesota license plates on it, and I just thought she was the coolest human being in the world. That's a fish out of water. And so she she's driving in, so like there was no like Hollywood pretension right, right, right. about her. She yeah. still had this like, and Minnesota is one of my favorite places in America because the people are so kind and down to earth. Minnesota and is then, a place that I think doesn't get enough credit for producing just a huge number of amazing artists. Bob Dylan, Bob Prince. Dylan, Prince, yeah, yeah, The Replacements. Mitch Hedberg, The Replacements. Hedberg, Husker, but like all over the map, <laughs> yeah. all from Minnesota. And it gets, it's like, what's going on there? Yeah. So, and then also, uh, and then Jensen Ackles. Right. They introduced him. He comes onto the show like episode number three, and he had just moved out from, Texas, from right? Dallas, Texas. Yeah. And I, I really thought he plays this really goofy character named Malcolm. And, you know, he was this muscular, handsome, all American boy. It's like David Hasselhoff. He was gorgeous, man. Do you talk about also jumping off the screen? Yeah. I mean, I, I thought that, you know, so I really believed that, that these people right. are going to be my family. And so um, I thought. He was also cheated because he got to play this. But I mean, I guess you know, as in a young actor, I guess you don't really. I, you probably to hear his version, he probably it's just a job, <laughs> just a job. Yeah, and that he didn't mind. Right. But the the it kind of pissed me off. Oh, we have this new student character, right. and then why make him this goofy airhead when he was not like that in real life at right. all? And then, you know, we had the. The sound stages they did to Sabrina, this teenage witch, right next to us, and so you got this, so you got these really thin spaces between these massive airplane hangar sound stages, and you know, in breaks, you know, he's Jensen Ackles is out there throwing the football. Yeah. I mean, he was the All American boy quarterback, but uh, I couldn't understand, you know, why they wouldn't let me be me, why they yeah. wouldn't, uh, why they uh, chose to make his character kind of an airhead, but. But still, you know, I had faith in the show until about halfway through, they started doing all these um, holiday episodes. We did a Christmas episode where I take all my students on a skiing trip for the Christmas Classic, break. Classic, because that happens. How many all the people time. spend their <laughs> Christmas break with their teacher in a cabin? If TV would have been everybody. And then we get snowed in. Oh, I wouldn't have seen that coming. And so. it was just so cheesy. It was yeah. painful. Although I enjoy the Halloween episode. That was the, that was cute. At the end, every all the students come in dressed like me. That was probably annoying. They have long hair. That was cute. Yeah. But uh, and, and then, then we, we we did a Thanksgiving episode. There was a. Quentin Tarantino Pilgrim play that I wrote right. uh, fictionally in the in the right. thing. So we, so we do a Halloween episode, a Thanksgiving episode, a Christmas episode, and a Valentine's episode. And if in your first season you're, you're doing that out. many holiday episodes, then the, the writers have clearly run out of yeah. ideas. That seems to be... And so you kind of saw the writing on the wall at that point, I imagine. Yeah. So after that, did you... Were you kind of jaded on watching TV after a while? Were you like, I don't want anything to do with it for a bit? Not yeah, anything. well, the um, canned laughter sitcoms, I yeah. I could not watch. Because you watched those growing up. Other than Barney Miller, did you watch it? Were there any other three cameras that come in Taxi? No, or, Taxi, I mean, yeah, but, but uh, you know, let's not forget that Lucille Ball invented the four camera yeah, absolutely. shoot. Yeah, that, and the rerun. That, that sitcoms are, yeah, that, right. that sitcoms are still shot to this day. Yeah. Lucille Ball is such a, a you know, and... Her story is incredible, man. Yeah. They they had no faith in her or uh, uh, Desi Arnaz, her husband, because he was he was Cuban, and they didn't yeah. think America would want to watch a, no. a, a dirty foreigner. Yeah, 
So she had to, they put their, their own house up. Right. They mortgaged their own house to make the first Lucille Bowles. And it's a mixed race marriage, which is kind yeah. of insane at the time. And she was considered kind of at the end of her career when she started that, because she was a Hollywood starlet that went through the studio system. Wow. And then is doing this comedy, and they were like, ah, this, this old lady, which is probably yeah. 30. Uh, you know, and the, the, the fact that that show became the show that's, you know, they're still running marathons of it to this to this day. And it's the paradigm of how shows are shown. Absolutely. And it's also odd that shows haven't changed that much. Although I found that people tend to write off the three-camera sitcom completely now as... The realm of children's shows and part of that was in the 90s it did move that way um, which you probably suffered from a little bit with with your show because i think that was kind of happening in the culture with 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 yeah. television with that with that format but to me that's the hardest kind of tv show to do well and so when those shows are quality like barney miller like roseanne like uh taxi cheers it's so much more impressive than a single camera sitcom that can use cinematic cheats to sort of make the show you can make good quality shows, but it seems a little easier. It's not, uh, you know, we're just in front of an audience and it's just the actors and the words. But that must have been ridiculously intimidating to have to act live in front of an audience with all these people kind of waiting around and you can't just do No, it. well, I tell you, I mean, I have always had a lot of self-confidence. Okay. And I, I really I took it. it. You know, the, the great thing that I'll never forget about doing the pilot I felt, and I knew my lines inside and out. Right. So, you know, when it's when you when you do the four camera shoot and you got the set, um, it's all in front of a studio audience. You know, in breaks from scenes, the actors all usually go backstage. I right. was so pumped for the pilot. Yeah. The best words when when you when they when they got the scene, and nothing needs to be reshot. The um, assistant director on the floor yells moving on <laughs> greatest words in television right. that's like it. first down right and i did feel like you know the star quarterback i right. would walk i would beat the cameras to the next scene and right. i when we shot the pilot i didn't go in the back because like, unless i was it. unless i was entering the scene from the back right 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 i was just so pumped and i moved on to the to, to the to the next scene um, so you, you never questioned your ability to do it. Sounds like you just no, jumped in. No, and uh, you know I, I think my acting got better as it went on. And like I said, you know, you look at Jerry Seinfeld, and it's like you don't have to be a great actor to star yeah. in a sitcom. You're a character, and they prop you up with great actors who've been around for. I mean, on Seinfeld. People talk about that on some cast, but all those people have been around for years. And right. A ton of things. I mean, I was always. You ever seen the movie Jacob's Ladder? really great, actually about Vietnam uh, in a lot of ways, chilling kind of horror movie that Adrian Lyne did, but uh, Jason Alexander's in it, <laughs> and it's from like 86, and uh, doing a dramatic role, and it's, it's really, actually Lewis Black is in it too. Wow. Uh, it's really weird seeing, when you see these people there, you go, oh, these guys have been around forever, Michael Richards on Fridays in 1980, and, yeah. and all this stuff, um, but people go, oh, this is brand new on TV. Do you ever see people that you worked with on Mr. Rhodes and things now? Like, I went Jensen's on Supernatural, obviously, for like 12 years. Are you ever flipping through and you're like... I've never it? seen it. It's a it's pretty decent show. Pretty decent show. Yeah, I've um, never seen it. I like, mean, you uh, know, there was no doubt that he was a superstar. Lindsay Sloan, uh, Alexander Holden, you know, Travis West Wester. Does it take you out of things? Sean Weiss. Ever... I'm still friends with... Sean Weiss. Yeah. Uh, I just saw him a few weeks ago. He's he's actually he's lost a lot of weight. He's kind oh, of skinny cool. now. And um, he he's he's doing stand up comedy. Um, he's a great guy. Uh, I'm I'm still friends with Ron Glass. Yep. I haven't seen him in a few years, but usually, um, I would see him every couple of years. Right. And and I'm 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 still very good friends with Stephen Tobolowski. Yeah. Went to dinner at his house um, a few weeks ago when I was in Los Angeles, and um, I cherish those friendships. And, and I think and that's unusual. Like most people, if they're in a one-season show, who've been who aren't sort of from the outside, who yeah. are in that world, yeah. you know, it's just people they worked with. But because for you, this was this was the family you were planning on having. It's it, it, you know, it, you have these long-lasting relationships, which is pretty great. Well, and I had Stephen Tobolowski on my podcast, and he said that. Uh, there's a great book, How Green Was My Valley. Yep. And he said that it, he compared our cast to How Green Was My Valley. That okay. We, that we were a family. 
and that we were all busted up and had right. to go find jobs in different places. Yeah, not not inaccurate. But Tobolowski, you know, he's come to shows of mine. Uh, I'm great friends with he and his wife Anne. It's less and like people you used to work with and more like people you went to camp with or that you went to college with or something, it seems, instead of just like a guy you worked with in an office. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and, and you know, Ron Glass... Um, I, you know, I feel like I should call him right now. I, <laughs> I, I, I miss the guy. Yeah. And, and, you know, you talk about just beautiful human beings. Yeah. You know, and uh, I, I'm surprised Ron Glass didn't star in more shows, have his own yeah. show. I was always surprised with that, too. One of the greatest American actors. And, you know, Barney Miller, man, that character he played, and he's working on his novel. Yeah, he doesn't want to Blood be Blood on the Badge. Yes, yeah. He, he doesn't want to be there. He wants to be a writer. Yep. And, and then, you know, his character, I think the writing was great for his character because he was the history teacher. Right. So uh, there was one scene where there's a school dance and he's dancing and Travis Vest Wester comes up. To, I keep saying Vester because I lived in Holland and that's how you, <laughs> that's how you pronounce W's. Travis Wester comes up to him and says, uh, Hey, Mr. Felcher, you should teach dance classes. And Ron Glass says to him, um, If you can't grasp the implications of the Dred Scott decision, you can't possibly yeah. uh, ever be able to do this. And he, like, you know, busts an ass wiggly dance move. So, I mean, like, so, so there was some great historical right. uh, things written for his, his history teacher. I always Sound. loved his interaction with Dietrich on Barney Miller because I love Steve Lattersberg too, and it was weird that those comedian, two, yeah, stand-up comic, and uh, they they always paired them together. And then there was the whole plot line where they were living together, which was really weird. Oh, I don't remember that. Uh, one. Dietrich uh, lost his apartment, and so uh, Ron Glass had to live with no the other way around. He couldn't find an apartment, and this had been going for like three seasons. And then he had to live with Lattersberg, and it was yeah. it was such a good. Um, not generic sort of odd couple. It was so well written. It's just it's when you go back and watch that show, it absolutely holds up with every single aspect of it. And you know, part of it is you have great guys like Ron Glass on it. But I I always thought he would be have his own show after that, or any of those guys after. I mean, he should have. Did. You know, I mean, and Tobolowski is um, one of the greatest character actors and comedic actors of all time. He's had a great great career. Yeah. You know, yeah. and 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 Tobolowski. You know, he's, I mean, and, and the Tobolowski Files, if yes. you've ever heard his People, podcast, yeah. is brilliant. Uh, one of my favorite podcasts. But, you know, he says that him going bald was the greatest thing that ever happened to him. Because now he's Because he wanted to be the leading man like everybody else. Yeah. And then when he went bald in his early 20s, he had no choice but to be right. the, 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 the. That character found him. Yeah. yeah. But what I learned from the sitcom is. You know, it's almost better to be a secondary character because if, if you're the second banana on a show, they don't blame you, you walk in and it's joke, 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 yeah. exit. Yep. You know, when you're the when you're the star, you have to to carry the plot. Right. And be around. And, you know, so the I had this of jokes. I had this love story with this character Nikki, played by Farrah Forky. So like, I, I thought that was tedious. Yeah. That I, I shoehorned in. It was shoehorned in, and and uh, it took up too much of my activity. I never, I never got. Um, fun, to do I it. never got funny dialogue or funny actions. It was either given nice advice to the kids or stammering around this though, like yeah. love story with this girl and the the. the um, they were trying to salmon Diane, yeah. Well, I just I think that. Uh, Peter Noah, who was the executive producer, I think, you know, his all-time hero is Woody Allen. Right. I love Woody Allen, but he, I think he kind of, the, this, this kind of uh, subservient, courtship, thing. neurotic uh, character to the woman, which is, it's not, That's I've not never been like see. that. Yeah. I've, I've never been a, a hat in the hand guy. Yeah, I've always been a very guy. bold you know, confident man. Right. And so, like, the, even even the love stories that I had to do with this girl is, like, I'm hoping she... Oh, no. I'm hoping she just, you know, sprinkles me a little, you know, attention or something, and it's... Is there a show that you've seen, either since Mr. Rhodes or before Mr. Rhodes, that you're like, that's the show that we I should have had? 
that kind of thing. That's the character. I no, be. you can't think in yeah. terms like that. But yeah. um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of great shows I I admire and love. Yeah. Um, was there anything else that you watched with your family as a, as a kid? What was your dad? What was your dad when he was controlling that television? What were the things that he? Watched? My dad loved the news. My okay. dad loved sixty minutes. We always watched sixty minutes. You would watch uh, it with him? Oh God! I I. I um, one of my favorite shows of all time, yeah. It's 60 Minutes, really. How old were you watching 60 Minutes? Since I was, since I wiped placenta off. Right, and you all, you were always yeah. into it? It wasn't like, oh no. No, my family's from Washington, D.C., so we've okay. always been very uh, political kind of and very aware. Right. Um, so uh, we've always stayed on top of, of current events and, um, and very well informed. So would you watch, say, 60 Minutes and then discuss it? Because I imagine as a yeah. kid, there's a lot of stuff that probably you'd need to talk about <laughs> to process after watching it. It wasn't just like... We're yeah, and I think it really helped my comedy, too. Yeah. To um, to know... What's going things on. Things that were happening in the world. You so know? That's interesting. You're not watching the sort of family fodder. You're, you're watching the, the sort of the, the real well, stuff. Well, my dad loved stand-up comedy. Okay. And my dad had comedy albums. So um, we did always watch the HBO... Uh, young one night stands, the, the young stands. comedian specials. That right. we watch those together. Always watched SNL. I always say SNL to me. I follow SNL the way other people follow baseball stats. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, that year this person was on, and oh, if they could have done this, it would, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. So I imagine you probably watch it that sort of way with your with your dad. Did you yeah. watch a lot of late night stuff as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was really great. You know, uh, my parents would usually go to bed. Right. And so. Did you have to sneak down? No. No, they just were like, eh. No, they knew I wanted to be a comedian. They knew it was my... Really? At that age, and they were supportive of it. Yeah. Was anyone else, any of your siblings, drawn towards performing or anything? Or? My sister um, wanted to be an actress. She okay. went. She went to Florida State to the drama school there. Right. So, so you know, her and I, my, my two older brothers were like kind of jock thug bullies. Right. And so me and my sister... It was always me and her against them right. whenever we played games or anything. And so we rebelled against them by being artsy right. and Watching sensitive. soap operas together. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, not necessarily soap operas, no, but, just, but yeah. the opposite going to plays, watching movies, talking right. about acting, you know. Um, I got my sister a job as a writer's assistant on my sitcom. And that was a thing that I, I wanted to tell you. There was a, a moment where I was really... Two moments that had happened where I was absolutely frustrated with the way things were going. Right. And I was getting pissed. And I always thought, you know, you read about actors and they throw these tantrums on the on the set of their right. sitcom and then they kick over the water cooler. Right. And uh, me and my sister always thought, you know, that was unnecessary and stupid that That's actors would do this. <laughs> and, um, you know, in retrospect, I wish I would have kicked over the cooler. Right. And right. throwing some tantrums. But she got to drive a golf cart around Universal. That's pretty good. And uh, to run errands for the writers. Yeah. And uh, there was twice where I was pissed, frustrated, and my sister said, jump on. Yeah. And we, she drove me to the back of the Universal lot, and there is a town square yeah. set the famous And it's yeah. where they filmed Back, back to the, the Future. Future. Yep. It's where Michael J. Fox... The, yeah, they harness the lightning yep. hitting the clock tower is there. and his DeLorean gets to go back to the future. And my yeah. sister took me on her uh, golf cart and we drove back there and she goes, look where we're at, Tom. From Florida. We're in Hollywood, man. We're on the Back to the Future. We're at Universal and you're making your own television show. Did you see Back to the Future with her when it came out? Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. So what a, what a, you yeah. know, 10 years later, there, there yeah. it is. That's the kind of thing that always strikes me when I'm out there is that everything's so familiar and you're like, there's the thing. It's that's the the one we saw on the thing. Yeah. So after that, you you felt a little bit better. Was she well, like, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was less pissed off. I yeah. mean, it's you know now that my sister is no longer of this earth, right. I th I think back of things have. like that and and it really makes it all worth it. You know, yeah. even though it was frustrating, the show had nothing to do with me. Um, it's still a thing most people never get to experience. And most most comedians, you never yeah. have their own show and uh, never have it named after them. Yeah, so that takes uh, some time. So, I mean, like, it, it took many years. I was uh, I, I was angry at the missed chance. Justifiably. And, and the, um, 
you know, the way I, you know, I had to live under this promise that every next week, next week, the, the script will get better next week. It never does. And, uh, it's like an abusive relationship. Yeah. I love you, baby. Next week, it'll yeah. be fine. But I really, really believed in my cast, and I thought the cast, I, I think the writers really had to work hard right. to fuck up that show. Yeah, which makes it worse, because you feel bad for everyone involved who couldn't... Well, well I think the they've all everyone. gone on to have yeah. great careers, but I, yeah. I think if you look at that cast that I had, it was not... They blew it. They blew for it. For them. It wasn't just some... Um, scenario yeah. that was against all human odds yeah. because we had everything and even with the premise of it being a teacher show and even though there were four teacher shows that year it stood and out. even though it was not an original premise for an American sitcom right. the power and talent of that cast that I had, um, I, I think it, it should have gone longer. I think it stood out. I, I remember enjoying it, and it definitely stood out among the other three shows, because I think Nick Farina was, um, uh, he was Dennis like, Farina, right? Was it Dennis Farina that was Nick Farina, licensed teacher? It was an actor that I really liked, and I remember being like, I don't like the show. I remember, what, like, it, it didn't seem um, cliched or trite, your show. It, it stood out. Uh, you know, it was still... It wasn't the most groundbreaking thing on the air, but I was like, oh, this is at least different, you know. Um, and it did get, there were some critics that enjoyed it. I remember reading some good It was 50 50. Yeah. I remember um, but you never the New York Times it. liked it, LA Times didn't. Right. Uh, Entertainment Weekly did not like it, just, but People Magazine did. Right. They, they, did a, they did a little highlight of me yeah. uh, that year. So it was, it seemed to be right down the middle, 50 right. 50. Right. So then you moved, uh, when did you move to Holland? Was it early 2000s? Well, then after that sitcom, I, uh, I looked at my money as my NBC artist grant. Right. You can do whatever and I want for a bit. And I moved to New York City. I had lived in New York when I was 20, like a dog. Miserable. And I always swore if I ever had any money, I would live in New York with style. Right. Yeah. So I got a rock star apartment in the Wall Street area. Nice. And then also... That um, sounds like a sitcom. <laughs> that should, uh, should have been. Yeah. Uh, that's the book. Yeah. And then um, I started making trips over to London. Yeah. So I just wanted to focus on, on being a stand-up. So I was living in New York, still doing road stuff around America, and then I started taking trips over to London. Before, and, before you got to London, when you were at post-show doing road work still, were people coming out because of the show or did they know you from the show or anything like that? Well, it was, that was the most difficult part because I had kind of um, rose to whatever notoriety I had right. from Comedy Central. Yeah. And those were all my jokes. Yeah. Those were all things I had That's written. You. And then yeah. Viva Vietnam was my idea. Right. And, uh, and so I had been, you know, I'd been living in San Francisco and my audience went from like tattooed punk rock lesbians right. to like uh, couples <laughs> couples in their 30s right. thinking that they were going to see this, you know, Nevish guy like, the, the, oh, the guy from the teacher. sitcom. Yeah. So yeah, I, I that was that was that was that was um, strange and difficult. But, um, but then you can go to London where they don't know the sitcom. Exactly. Well, it's your they don't have any of that history. Which is exactly. Cool. So I went to. I started making trips to London. I got in with London. Yep. And then I was going to London a um, couple times a year, playing the Comedy Store yep. up the creek, and um, Camden Jonglers. Yep. And London was really London completely opened up to me, and I got in uh, with all the best clubs in London, and then that led to other gigs around Europe. Right. And I, I, you know, great gig in Paris, Amsterdam, everywhere. And had you ever been to any of those places before this? No. So that's going to be just a whole, I mean, taking that in must have been kind of crazy. Doing, especially doing comedy in Yeah, I'd never been to Europe. But I mean, I, 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 I always respect British comedians. Right. And I love British comedy. So I, I, I thought, you know, if, if you're great... Right. You, you know, it's like being in with New York, right. you know, and I had finally uh, cracked New York and I was living there and playing all the best clubs. And uh, and that was my intention. I kind of um, felt like TV didn't um, 
turn out the way I right. had anticipated. Did that? And that stand-up do. comedy was my first love, and yeah. so I wanted to 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 get back to my first love. And you can control it. It's now yeah. all you. you exactly. Don't, you do the jokes you want to do. If someone says something about your hair yeah. in the crowd, you can respond. Exactly. You, know, you don't. You don't have all these people telling you what you can and can't do. So, so I. So so I'm um, living in London. I got him. I got. I'm living in New York. Got yeah. in with London, and then I'm. So I'm. I'm starting to to take all these trips to to Europe. The last yeah. year I was living in New York. I was going to London a lot, and then Europe, and then I I played in Amsterdam, uh, and I. Fell in love with a girl. Yep. And then I moved there uh, in 2000. Yeah. And then you had a talk show for, what, four years? Five years? Then the relationship with the girl didn't work out. And I was just about to move back to the United States when these people um, from this Dutch television network saw me performing at Tumler. That's the best comedy club in Amsterdam. Um, and they were looking for an American to host a late night talk show like David Letterman. So and I ended up just starting I got the job. Now, did you watch Letterman at the time? I mean, you were watching the late night shows to watch stand-ups, but Letterman in the mid-80s was like the youth no, stand-up. No, are you kidding me? I show. worshipped Letterman. What's funny yeah. is my wife doesn't like Letterman. and uh, She's only seen him now? She's though? only seen him in, in, in the latter years. Which is very different. And I've tried to explain to her how, how groundbreaking and how edgy yeah. he was. And, you know, he used to do viewer mail yeah. on Thursdays. Yeah. And I was such a fan. I would, um, in... Um, in, in, in class, I had uh, I worked in the library right. for one of my hours where I would, um, you know, check Final people's books, books exactly. out, put books back, do the Dewey Decimal System and all that stuff. And they had, you know, period. I looked up everything that had anything to do with comedy. Yeah. And that was great about working in the library. That was before Google, yeah. you know, where you had to, like, you were getting consult the card catalog <laughs> yeah. for anything to do with comedy. Physically so I flipping. would sit there... At the the library uh, checkout desk, yep, and I would compose these letters to David Letterman, uh, trying to be funny, right? Because I wanted him Impressive. to read it yeah. on on viewer mail. Did you ever get anything on? No. Yeah. No. Those or maybe yeah, if I did, I wasn't watching. Yeah. But um, so yeah, then I I, I got to be. Uh, I got to be a late night talk show guy right. in Amsterdam. So I I did that for three years, and then. And then it was mostly the Dutch celebrities, but we would have a few visiting Americans. Steve O, Tenacious D was from on. Jackass. Yeah. Tenacious D was on. I uh, that's on YouTube where I got to give him a tour right. of Amsterdam. So people there though finally were seeing you on TV as you, more or less. But it's in Amsterdam. <laughs> yeah, and that's the funny thing is they um, wanted to call the show Kevin Masters because they bought the concept where we would find an American and he has this flashy showbiz name, right. Kevin Masters. So the funny thing about the Mr. Rhodes show was I played Tom Rhodes, that but the Tom character Rhodes. had nothing to do with me. And then right. finally I'm on television in Holland and I get to completely be myself. But the, it's it was not called Kevin Masters. So. That's, the, that's the yin-yang. The universe so had to I'm, write I'm itself. I'm waiting about. for uh, one day I will have my porridge and it will be just right. Would you ever do a sitcom again? Yeah, sure. Yeah. But I would want to be the second banana. Yeah. I wouldn't, wanna, I wouldn't, no wa I wouldn't want the love story. Right. right. I wouldn't want to be in charge of the nice advice um, to the... the the comedic character to come in and joke, joke, joke. That's what I've always admired. And uh, and like I said, the person who can't be outwitted. And it's like when you're heckled in a club, you yeah. don't, you know, you don't, you don't shrug. Yeah, you go, oh, I guess you got. You me. don't shrug. Yeah. You fucking, you go for the juggler. And that's I think. And you rip their heart out. So then after the the late night talk show in Amsterdam, as if that was not fortuitous enough, when that ended, the same network. You're in. Uh, now they're called Veronica. They let me be a presenter on a travel program. Brings us back to Emmanuel. <laughs> you got to travel the world like in the Emmanuel series. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> With, exactly. Without the sexual exploits <laughs> on camera for the thing. Uh, and, you know, and, and then that was great. So I, I got to do a highlight on... Uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, on Peru, right. one of the greatest trips I ever took in my life. I went to Peru and I filmed it. Uh, the Champagne region of France, the Dutch Caribbean. So I really had this dream life on Dutch television. Which was kind of coming back to the, the Vietnam special almost. Like the first thing you got to do that wasn't stand-up on TV 
and it ends up. I mean, I know they're not exactly the same, but yeah. it's sort of a similar. Well, and they, they. I mean, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they wanted to. Uh, I mean, in retrospect, I should have stayed with Comedy Central and just tried Done to that. push that show. Um, but that stand-up comedy did not exist around the world no. the way it does now. No. I just went back to Vietnam last June to do shows. Right. I met a Vietnamese comedian. Uh, Min Ha Pham, and she, she's from Hanoi. She does stand up. Yeah, which they never There's have. comedy all over Asia now. There's yeah. comedy all over Europe, all over the world. And I've been trying to push, push this um, television show where I'm the Anthony Bourdain of comedy, right. where I get to go check out comedy scenes around the world yeah. and highlight comedians from those places. So I, I filmed a, 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 a pilot on my own on Malaysia. Right. Because it's a, it's a Muslim country. You got Malay Muslims, Indian Hindu, and then Chinese people. That's right. the populace of the country, and that's the populace of their stand-up scene. And, and they all ruthlessly make fun of each other's ethnicities right. and religions, which we would never do. No. Because, like, we're so politically correct. Oh, oh yeah. you can't make fun of Asians if you're not Asian or whatever. So um, I've been trying to make this show... Uh, for the past few years, and uh, Comedy Central said no, the Travel Channel said no. It's been about three years since I pitched right. it, and I keep making these little videos. Right. But that is the dream television show right. that I want to make. This so, travel show about comedy. And, this, yeah, about worldwide comedy, and what are people making jokes about in other countries? Cause what, it, what's their humor like? Right, because it doesn't translate necessarily. And so, get, when, you know, whenever you know, I watch a lot of foreign movies, and, and uh, especially like Hong Kong movies, and whenever you watch the comedies, they're like, oh, this is very local Hong Kong humor. And I'm like, I don't think this is funny. But I'm fascinated by it because I want to know why this is funny there. Yeah, <laughs> you know that kind of thing is pretty fascinating because there's I did, a great stand-up scene in Hong Kong. I'm going yeah. back there in May. My friend and, Joe and Wong Beijing. Uh, does there's there a, lot. a um, there's a great financial analyst for Chinese television, Tony Chu, who does comedy. You can name comedy. any city in the world, and I know. Someone who a, does comedy. A, there. A, someone who does stand-up comedy there. It's like because that. I've I've spent my life. You know, and that's the great thing. That's a unique. Uh, it's position. great that the Mr. Show, Mr. Rhodes show did not work out. You never would have got to do that because I would have stayed living in the Hollywood Hills, right? And um, I would not have been the stand-up comedian that right. I am today. I would not have traveled the world right. doing comedy the way I have. And um, you know, I don't live anywhere. I've had everything in storage for nine years. You're just, okay with that? I love it. My beautiful yeah. photographer wife travels with me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I love it. I, I think that's where I get my adrenaline rush. Some people like yeah. to jump out of airplanes or rock climb or whatever. For me, the adrenaline rush is to go to a different country right. and not know if certain jokes are going to work. Right. And then while you're up there, you have to make this Adjust. mental adjustment in your brain. And that's, right. that's frankly, where I get my rocks yeah, it's off. It's the chess game. It's a cat and mouse of, of you know, what can... It's, I always think it's like... Uh, it, it, it's like when people watch a Sherlock Holmes thing, you know, when, when he's like deducting and then it all works out. When you're on stage and that works that way, that's the kind of like sense of satisfaction you get where you're like, yes, I solved the, I solved the mystery here and all, yeah. you know, I yeah, deducted. To, to stand on stage in a different country, gripping a microphone, making people laugh. Yeah. I mean, I love it. And trying to be universal without being stupid. I find yeah. it's always, it's difficult. Well, stupid comedy won't work, and regi yeah. regional comedy won't yeah. work. You have to have some kind of intelligence for, I mean, to, to, to play in London yeah. or Hong oh, Kong yeah. or Amsterdam and then be invited back they year after year. They expect more of you. Yeah. You can't sort of rely on crutches that people yeah. do here when they travel just in the U.S. So what was the first, I think the first thing I remember you doing stand-up on was like maybe MTV Half Hour Comedy yep. Hour. Was that the first thing you did or had you done a late night stuff before that? I think I had done Evening at the Improv first, okay. but I, mean, I did I did two um, MTV Comedy Half Hour yeah. shows. And you really and, stood out on that. And, I, and I, had the, I, had, I had the long hair yeah. and I killed it. And then they actually... Um, had um, auditioned me to like be a VJ. But you were you interested in doing that at all? Well, I wanted to be funny, so yeah. I remember um, they and they they got you know typical cable television. Yeah, we've only got twenty dollars to film something. Right, right. Um, and um, 
So we filmed something on Hollywood Boulevard where I was like, you know, talking to people right. and stuff. Um, yeah, no. Because that was probably what, 1990, maybe 91? Maybe 91, yeah, they 92? Were, that's when they hired Ben Stiller and he was a VJ for a while. Mm. And um, Alex Winter from Bill and Ted had a show on there. They were like really just kind of throwing all this weird experimental stuff out uh, at the time. And then MTV Network Zone. Comedy Central at the time too, I think. Right? Was that did that? Well, Viacom, like, Viacom yeah. owns them all, right? Yeah. But uh, but yeah, no that 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 MT, those MTV half hour comedy hours were like huge. Yeah. And yeah. I got um, you know uh, that that a lot of people knew me from that before the. I think that helped with the Comedy Central. Right, because then you, you did the interstitial stuff on Comedy Central, which yeah. was very MTV-ish. I remember it seeming really... Um, yeah, they filmed my jokes like rock videos. Right, and you were like them. hanging from a... I was in a jail cell yeah, 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 yeah. where the first set, and then the next set they did on the docks in New York City. Uh, those were great. Man. Yeah, I, I loved those, and they definitely stood out and made it... You know, to that point when you were watching comedy on TV, it was... Even on the late night shows, if it was an act that was unique, they still sort of had to fit into a late night show format, you know? Yeah. If it was a guy that never wore a suit on stage, when they were on Letterman, they weren't a suit. <laughs> you know, or they were yeah. a suit. So I remember the comedy, comedy well, central. I remember, the, I remember everybody, uh, uh, one of the best, one of those interstitial commercials I did was, uh, at the time, everybody was making fun of Chelsea Clinton. Right. For being so ugly. ugly. Right. And I did this kind of love poem to her. Right. Where I, I, I think you're a, a, a sweet little biscuit, Chelsea Clinton, and I would love to braid your hair sometime. Right. And so I said, like, all these loving things about her, and I was kind of defending her. I thought it was really cruel. Right. Oh, it's And so, like, yeah. that was like, oh, man, I loved how you stood so up for Chelsea, Chelsea yeah, you know? Yeah. And I was living in San Francisco and, like, you know, kind of um, just, you know, nerdy uh, girls... Um, You're our voice. <laughs> well, I just, I, yeah. I, I, you know, like it, it was, a lot of people thought it was really cool that I had done that. Yeah, well, that stood out a ton because that was that was like at the time the go-to punchline it was like Chelsea Clinton, right? Who was like thirteen? Yeah, which was twelve or thirteen. Yeah, it was thirteen. Imagine being thirteen and not being able to turn on a television. Just because everyone's talking about how yeah. ugly you are. Jesus. Jeez, that's that's Twilight Zone material right there. Yeah. Um, I'm sure she. I wonder if that ever got back to her. Uh, as a, as mm. a nice thing. She's hosting the t Today Show, or one, she's a correspondent on one of the well. TV stations now. Uh, so do you watch anything now? Now when I watch things, it is, um, you know, because I travel, it's always right. uh, have to buy the, the, the season. Right. Uh, we watch Netflix a lot. My wife and I, we love documentaries. Documentaries right. are probably our number one thing. But, um, you know, we'll buy series. And we'll watch the whole thing, like right. uh, Rome. Louis, I seen yeah. you know. The, I think the the first three seasons of Louis yeah. were great. Louis great. I mean that that seems to capture a, a guy on a show more yeah. than anything. Yeah, and that's great. You talk about the single camera shot versus the, the 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 sitcom in front of a set shot. I think that you know that's the new paradigm on how yeah. But he's, comedies are shot, and not every comedy right. is going to be that good. Right. You he's know? an interesting case, too, because you can actually look, directly compare, because he did that Lucky Louie show, which was the three-camera honeymooner show, yeah. but was still very him, and then Louie, which is the exact opposite, and they both work with him. It's weird. People hated Lucky Louie, and I remember really liking it, because I liked that someone was taking that format and doing something them with it, Yeah. which people I don't think want to take on. Other than Barney Miller... What were some of the other shows that you absolutely loved as a kid? Was there anything else that you, like, absolutely, it was appointment television, that was your show, or maybe your siblings didn't like and you always had to fight for? Uh, Family Ties was big. I, me and my sister used to watch that. We loved yeah. the brother-sister relationship. Yeah. And I thought it was funny that her, the parents were left-wing intellectuals. and right. that. You identified got, with that. That, that, that he rebels by right. being a, a hardcore Republican. Right. I thought that was a great premise. Um, taxi, Cheers, um, SNL. What was your favorite era from SNL? I would say the Eddie Murphy years. Okay. The, yeah. The Lauren Michaels list years, the 80 to 85. Was he not there? 
He left in 79 with oh, the well. first cast, and then Dick Eversol, actually Jean Duranian came in. She was there for the first half of 1980, which yeah. was the disaster when they had... Uh, when I, when I wasn't Cooper writing Confrey. letters to David Letterman, I was writing letters to Eddie Murphy. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was closer to your age, too. I mean, he was only 17, 18 oh, yeah. years on that show. You know, you're a kid, you think... Uh, you know, that's why, like, when people send me fan emails, I always write them back. Right. Because I know... What it's like. How much it would have meant if someone would have oh, written absolutely. me back. And oh, and then I got whack job... Um, Fan letters when I did the Mr. Rhodes show, I remember some guy writing me saying that um, the Rockefellers owned NBC right. and that they were theory. involved in a communist conspiracy to overthrow democracy in America. And because I now worked for NBC, I was implicated in their communist plot to overthrow America. And I wrote the guy back. Oh, you wrote him back? Oh, fuck yeah, I did. Wrote him back a very short note. Dear Bob, whatever. I may be a communist, but it has nothing to do with the Rockefellers. <laughs> That's amazing. Sincerely, Tom Rhodes. And then he didn't write you back. No. Because normally they screen that stuff for a lot of them. Yeah, actors. no. They just gave you everything. No. Yeah. That's no. great. I, when I worked at the local NBC affiliate, I, I, had to, I was the person who screened the mail when I was in college. Mm. And I kept all the craziest shit. Like people, <laughs> this guy sent us plans he made for a time machine. Wow. There was a guy who had this utopian society he designed that we would live in domes. They would just send them. I still have That's funny. Of just the, this is the great thing about the Gerald Ford Museum in Grand Rapids, Michigan, is they have a display of all the whack job uh, letters that were written to him. You stole my patent for your hair. <laughs> or like whatever bizarre things. Yeah. yeah, there was all kind. Of, my favorite time was this guy sent in a package with individual letters to all the news anchors, but he mailed it in one big package. So the individual letters didn't have postage on them so and they were cra there was some crazy thing it wasn't threatening but it was something about like i don't know angels are actually time traveling demons mm. from space it's some craziness and so the weatherman comes and gets his mail and, and a minute later he comes running in and he's waving this letter in my face he goes why did you write this to me why did you write this to me? I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't write this to you. He goes, you think I don't know? I know this came from in here. There's no postage on it. <laughs> and I'm like, it was in this package with all the other ones. Wow. And then he was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, you wow. think I'm writing crazy letters? Back off, Les Nesman. Yeah. Were you a Bailey or were you a... a, a yeah. Bailey, the yes. nerdy girl. Yes, yeah, yeah, no. Never, I've never been... I never liked blonde women. Yeah, I was going to uh, draw that I've always up. liked. I've always liked nerdy girls with glasses and dark hair. Which goes back to your show where you're saying that Maybe though, I think <laughs> she was the Bailey. Why I think Lindsay Sloan was so Lindsay beautiful. Lindsay Sloan was your Bailey. She was my Bailey. Yeah, there you go. You got to do a Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for doing the show. Ken, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. And, uh, you know, gosh, thanks for having me on. You're welcome. Now I'm very proud of the Mr. Rhodes show. You should be. You should be. <laughs> they're, they're, they may be families. That that was their show. They heard the Mr. Rhodes theme music. And, and that they would have danced, danced in front of the... Danced now, see, that TV. would make me very happy. Yeah, there you go. Let's, I'm sure that happened. <laughs> we can't prove it didn't. I was happy that, that, that you know it took it took many years to to get over my frustrations yeah. and the things that I was unhappy about and the fact that I wouldn't get any jokes. But um, my wife has helped remind me that you know, hey man, you had your own sitcom right. and it lasted for an entire season. Yeah, it was not one episode. It was not um, dumped loudly. Yeah. Um, you know, after a few episodes, I got to do an entire. Season and yeah. um, there's not many people that are in that list, right? I mean, like the, the I remember growing up with the baseball encyclopedia, and if you played in one inning in the major leagues, your name was in that yeah, book. Yeah, you're in the book. But uh, you know, I had a whole season with my name on the show. Yeah, and I'm still good friends with um, you know some of the people, my castmates. That I never probably would have met otherwise. And if there's a you kid know, working, Stephen Tobolowski is a good friend of mine. Yeah, you know, Ron Glass from Ron Barney Miller that you were watching with yeah. your your mom and your sister. You how know, many people? Uh, how many people have that? Yeah, that's amazing. And 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 television was sort of able to give you that at, at, and like at a I, price. And like I was gonna say that I never would have had that great life in Europe. Right. Having my own late night talk show in Amsterdam right. and then doing the travel show, none of that would have happened. 
if you had done it, five if, seasons. If it wasn't for my NBC artist grant. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, I still love NBC, and I'm, I'm still grateful that I had that experience. Yeah, sometimes things just end up working themselves out in the way that they're kind of supposed to work out, I think, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ken. Oh, baby, I, I see you in my And there you go. That was Tom Rhodes. Really, really great guy. As I said, smart guy, interesting guy. Really enjoyed spending some time with him and getting to chat. Uh, as always, you can find me at tvguidancecounselor at gmail.com. You can email me at canadaicanread.com, uh, TV Guidance on Twitter, our Facebook page. Make sure you like those. Uh, also, please make sure you subscribe on iTunes because I do episodes not just on Wednesdays. I might do them on a Friday or a Saturday. Who knows? If you don't subscribe, you may miss out. And if you like the show, please rate and review the show. It really helps get up the iTunes charts and makes more people hear about the show, which is always very nice. So once again, thank you for listening, and we'll see you again next time on TV Guidance Counselor. I wanted to be a gardener, but the point is probably moot. I love gay people, and I personally find bitchy queer humor is at the top of my list. Oh, absolutely. I think you're a, a, a sweet little biscuit, Chelsea Clinton, and I would love to braid your hair sometime.